Let us <clears throat> resume the public worship of God, <clears throat> and we will sing to his praise from Psalm number 77. <clears throat> Psalm 77, and at verse 15. And, <clears throat> and we'll sing on to the end of the chapter, uh, end, end of the psalm. Psalm 77, at verse 15. To thine own people, with thine arm, thou didst redemption bring. To Jacob's sons and to the tribes of Joseph that do spring. The waters, Lord, perceived thee, the waters saw thee well, and they for fear aside did flee. <clears throat> the depths on trembling fell, for clouds and water forth were poured. Sound loudly did the sky, and swiftly through the world abroad, thine arrows fierce did fly. By thunder's voice alongst the heaven, a mighty noise did make. By lightnings lightened was the world. The earth trembled, did, and shake. Thy way is in the sea. And in the waters great thy path, yet thy footsteps hid, O Lord. None knowledge thereof hath thy, thy people. Thou didst safely lead like to a flock of sheep. In Moses' hand and Aaron's thou didst them conduct and keep these words to God's praise. Psalm 77 at verse 15, to thine own people with thine arm. <clears throat> to thine own people <clears throat>
Let us stand to pray. O oh, gracious God, give us grace, we pray, tonight to enter into the most holy place and to do business with thee. Help us, O oh Lord. Give us grace to stir ourselves up, to take a hold of thee in prayer and in worship, to seek thy face, to enjoy thy communion, and to glorify thee. For is this not man's chief end? To glorify thee and to enjoy thee forever. This was the great purpose of our lives. And we pray, O oh Lord, that as we come into thine house on thine own holy day, that we would fulfill that great mandate. There is nothing more sacred than to come into this place and to offer thee up worship. And we pray that our worship would be right and true and from the heart. O oh Lord, we avouch to worship thee. We claim thee as our God and we forsake all others. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would walk in thy ways, in newness of life, taking heed to thy law, thy commandments and judgments and statutes, or that we would hearken unto the voice of the Lord who speaks to us tonight. The psalmist said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, or give us grace to follow thee into the pages of scripture tonight and help us to give ourselves over to worship as a peculiar people bought with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we come. It is in his name that we believe that we are invested with all his merits all that he has done or we come as it were with a lamb in our arms and we pray that thou wouldst bless us oh lord pour a blessing down from heaven so great and so wonderful tonight that there is not enough room to receive it and bless thy dear people as they gather oh what a joy it is to go to the house of god and what a joy oh lord it is for thee to see thy people gather there is not a grander, nor, nor more glorious sight than the assembly of the saints. But, O oh Lord, we come and we confess that we are sinners. We confess our natural state before thee, that the head is sick, that our hearts faint. Yea, O oh Lord, from the crown of our head to the soles of our feet, there is no soundness within us but bruises and wounds and putrefying sores. We acknowledge, O oh Lord, the natural waywardness and crookedness of our own heart. Thy word says that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? And when we look through the pages of history and we see the barbarity that man inflicts upon his fellow man. Can we not attribute this all to the natural evil working of men's hearts? And so, O oh Lord, we come and we confess that by nature we are fallen, by nature we are evil. By nature, O oh Lord, we stand as those that are fallen and disgraced. But, O oh God, we cry out unto thee tonight that for thee to have mercy upon us. O oh Lord, forgive our sins. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for our sinnership. And see us, O oh Lord, constituted as those in the beloved, the Lord Jesus Christ. For his sake, O oh God, cleanse our sin. 
Remove it as far as the east is distant from the west. Oh, we thank thee that there is a fountain open for sin and for uncleanness. May we avail ourselves of that blessed fountain tonight. And oh, purge us. Oh, we thank thee for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee that he came in the fullness of time and that he did what no one could do. No mere man could do. He obeyed the law perfectly and offered himself up upon the cross as a once and for all sacrifice to satisfy divine justice. And oh, we bless thee that that was not the end. Oh, the story did not end there. It only went on. He rose again from the dead. And even now he is seated at the right hand of God, interceding night and day for his church. Oh, may we be conscious of that tonight. The prayers of the Savior. Oh, gracious one, we thank thee for him and we thank thee that he says to those who come and confess their sins, son, daughter, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Oh Lord, may we know that afresh in our experience tonight. May the blood of the Lord Jesus sprinkle our consciences anew and purge us from dead works to serve thee, the living and true God. Oh Lord, we need thy help. We come and we confess that we are weak, frail creatures at the best of times. Give us grace to advance in our Christian walk. Oh, that we might be more spiritually minded. Oh, Lord, save us from having only that mere form of godliness and denying the power thereof. Oh, that we would put on the new man every day and put aside the old. That we would labor to lay aside every weight and every sin that so easily besets us. Help us to run with patience. That race set before us, looking unto the author of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to strive. Help us to tread that narrow way that leads to eternal life. And, oh, Lord, when we do this, when, when we deny ourselves, we realize at once that there are enemies that assail our souls, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And these are mighty enemies against our souls. But all oh, we thank thee that the friend of sinners is mightier still. O oh Lord, we confess that so often our cross is heavy to bear. We confess that the way to heaven is rough. And so often we feel perhaps like Paul who groaned within his spirit. And he could say, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? But, oh, Lord, encourage us tonight. Give us to know that when we deny ourselves and take up our cross daily, we are fulfilling thy will. And thou hast said that those who follow after thee can be likened to thy mother and thy brethren. And so encourage us, oh, Lord, that we are thine own kith and kin, thine own near relation. O oh, gracious one, we pray then for thy help tonight. Bless thy dear people. Give us grace every day to look to thee. Help us in all the ups and downs of life. We thank thee, O oh Lord, for this congregation. We bless thee for, the, for its continued witness. We thank thee for all the work that goes on at the Sabbath school. Bless the children. Oh, Lord, we pray that they would remember their creator in the days of their youth. Remember, oh, Lord, thy servant, whom thou hast set over the congregation in holy things. How we thank thee so much for him. And we pray that thou wouldst bless him and bless his dear wife and family. We commit them to thee and we pray that thou wouldst remember them. Give them grace and strength every day. And all, oh Lord, bless thy servant as thou new moderator. Help him in all the duties that lie before him that take up perhaps more time and are more complex. Grant him wisdom, grant him gifts, grant him, O oh Lord, 
um, that strength of character, that strength of mind, lead him by thy spirit. And all oh, we pray that he might know thy blessing. Remember, O oh Lord, those tonight who are still strangers to thy grace. Remember them, O oh Lord, and have mercy upon them. Let sinners be converted. Hold out the golden scepter and say, live. And that time shall be a time of love. Or oh, may they awaken to the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, help us and bless us. Remember those who are recovering from operations. Those perhaps are about to face operations. We commit such to thee. Remember the housebound. Be a little sanctuary to them. And bless all thy dear people. Let thy kingdom come, O oh Lord. Let thy will be done. And help us now as we continue to worship thee. Bless us. Forgive all our sins for Christ's sake. Amen. <clears throat> <clears throat> Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Exodus, chapter 13. <clears throat> Exodus, chapter 13, and we shall pick up the reading of verse 17. And we will read on into the next chapter. Exodus, chapter 13 beginning to read at verse 17. <clears throat> Let us hear the word of the Lord. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest, peradventure, or perhaps, the people repent when they see war, and they return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. And they took their journey from Succoth and encamped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, <clears throat> Speak unto the children of Israel that they turn and encamp before Pahahiroth, between Migdol and the Red Sea, over against Baal Zephon, before it shall ye encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land, the wilderness hath shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, that he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled and the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this? That we have let Israel go from serving us. And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he pursued after the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with an high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, and his horsemen, and his army, and overtook them, encamping by the sea beside Pahahiroth, before Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord, and they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou thus dealt with us? 
to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. <clears throat> for the Egyptians, whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh, and upon all his host, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these so that the one came not near the other all the night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked upon the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels that they drave them heavily. So that the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus, the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. And so on. May the Lord bless that public reading, and may he follow with his blessing. Well, let us continue to sing to God's praise, this time from Psalm 78. <clears throat> Psalm number 78. And we shall commence the singing at verse 12. Psalm 78, verse 12. Things marvelous he brought to pass when fathers them beheld within the land of Egypt done, yea, even in Zoan's field. By him divided was the sea. He caused them through to pass and made the waters so to stand as like an heap it was. With cloud by day, with light of fire all night, he did them guide. 
In desert rocks he clave and drink as from great depths supplied. He from the rock brought streams like floods, made waters to run down, yet sinning more in desert they provoked the highest one. These words, Psalm 78, verses 12 to 17, things marvelous he brought to pass. Things marvelous he can we return to that portion of God's word that we read a moment ago to Exodus chapter 14. Now we'll be considering with God's help the whole of this chapter tonight but perhaps we could read again the final verse verse 31 and Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant, Moses, and so on. <clears throat> Apart from the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the parting of the Red Sea is undoubtedly one of the greatest miracles in the Bible. It's sweeping, it's epic, it's dramatic, 
It's stirring. It's filled with awe and wonder. And to this day, it continues to fascinate the believer and unbeliever alike. Even the atheist will look at this portion of scripture and they'll try to explain this event by referring to natural causes. They deny that something supernatural took place on that day. But all they're doing is embarrassing themselves. This is no less than a miracle. And we're to believe it as such. In fact, so great was this miracle, so mighty the deliverance, it was forever etched into the memory of Israel. The psalmists refer to it. We were singing a moment ago in Psalm 77 and 78. The prophets speak of it. And he was even known among the heathen. Do you remember what Rahab said to the spies? She said, we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when ye came out of Egypt. Even the heathen knew about this miracle. And then when you move into the New Testament, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, applies the miracle of, uh, applies the miracle to the life of the church and compares their passage through the waters to Christian baptism. We'll return later on to consider that. But he says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud. He's referring there to the cloud of pillar and fire. And all passed through the sea and were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And then we find another reference to the Red Sea. In the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 11, we read at verse 29, by faith, by faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the, which the Egyptians are saying to do or trying to do, were drowned. The deliverance of Israel on that day was a decisive victory against his enemy and against their enemy. And it was God's greatest act of redemption until the advent of the Lord Jesus Christ himself and what he accomplished on the cross. Now we see the Lord Jesus Christ here in this chapter. Where, you say? Well, he doesn't appear as he does in the earlier chapters of the Bible in temporary human form as the angel of the Lord. He doesn't take up that form. Now he takes up a different form, a mighty form of the form of the mighty pillar of fire. Readily seen by the Lord. He's mentioned in chapter 13, verses 21 and 22. And we read of the angel of God or the angel of the Lord in chapter 14, verses 19 and 20. So Christ is here and we're looking for Christ and we'll deal with the angel as we go on. But the title for our meditations tonight is Israel's D-Day. Israel's Deliverance Day. The angel who fights. We're going to notice three things. We're going to notice, first of all, a mysterious providence. Secondly, a clear plan. And thirdly, a separated people. <clears throat> A mysterious providence, a clear plan, and a separated people. 
First of all, let us consider a mysterious providence. We read in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 14, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pihahiroth, between Migdol and the sea, over against baal Zephon. Before it shall ye encamp by the sea. Shortly after Passover, the Lord commanded Moses to take two million people with him and to travel south and to encamp between Migdol and the Red Sea over against Baal Zephon. Now, these are names that are strange to us. You look at a map today, you won't find those names, but they were well known in ancient times. We don't know where exactly the children of Israel crossed. Scholars today believe that the Red Sea actually extended further north than what it appears today on a map. So it is entirely possible that the children of Israel crossed at some point along what we now call today the Suez Canal. Now, the road that God told them to take was, first of all, not altogether an erratic one. It was not altogether an erratic one. We might suppose, reading this particular chapter, that the angel of the Lord deliberately led his people into difficulty in order to make their deliverance plainer and more evident. Now, it is true. The Lord made their path crooked. He hemmed them in. He did bring them into difficulty, but he didn't lead them into danger in order to show how easy it was for him to rescue them out of danger. This wasn't some kind of publicity stunt. The Lord does not lead his people into danger for the sake of it. As a matter of fact, if you look at a Bible atlas and you consider the geography of the land and the possible routes open to the children of Israel to take at that time to the promised land, and you marry that in with what scripture says, it becomes clear very quickly that there were no easy roads to take. The way of the Philistines, for example, which was the most obvious, direct route to the promised land, was blocked. Exodus chapter 13, verse 17, And it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, not the way of Egypt, as it's called elsewhere, although that was near, for God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. The highway northeast toward the promised land that hugged the coastline was heavily guarded by Egyptian fortresses. Formidable Egyptian fortresses and seemingly blocked by a wide canal. And the risk of open war upon an unprepared people was far too great. They were not ready for war. And so the Lord did not take them. He did not expose them to danger. Another route was to go around the Red Sea. But this would have taken them far out of the way, straight into the desert and into the territory of various war-mongering tribes that would have attacked them as well. The only safe path open to them, seemingly, was to march south and to keep on going and going past what's known as the Great Bitter Lake toward Baal Zephon and to stop at the Red Sea. Verse 18, but God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up, harnessed out of the land of Egypt. And so we must remember, friends, that God had this route 
in mind from the very beginning. This wasn't God making it up as he went along. This wasn't God winging it, as we say. This was something that had been decreed from all eternity. He was going to lead them to this very spot. So the road that God told them to take was not altogether an erratic one. There was reason, there was logic behind it. But it was at the same time a strange one. It was a strange one. Pharaoh, when he heard what was happening, must have thought that the Israelites were wandering around aimlessly, not knowing where to turn. Pharaoh thought that they had let themselves into a trap. And even if their intention was to cross the Red Sea, they couldn't pass over it. There was no natural land bridge to connect them to the other side. There were no ships that could bear two million people across. There was nothing like that. As far as Pharaoh was concerned, it was impassable and therefore impossible. He knew they were surrounded by mountains. He knew the geography of the land. He knew that to the north lay vast Egyptian fortresses. He knew that to the south lay a great desert. To the west, well, that was the way they'd come from. That was the land of Egypt, the land of Goshen. They weren't going to go back. They'd just come from there. And to the east, well, to the east lay the Red Sea. And what was going to happen there? <laughs> Surely nothing. He knew they were surrounded. And he figured that if he marched on them quickly, he could box them in and slaughter every last one of them. He thought they were trapped. Reminds us, doesn't it, friends, how strangely God moves in the experience of his people. We have to remember that Israel had faithfully followed the pillar of cloud and fire through the wilderness. They hadn't deviated from the right nor to the left. They kept their eyes fixed on this pillar. And yet now they found themselves in this strange cul-de-sac, this place called Baal Zephon, with no way out. You know, friends, God does not always take his people on an easy path. He leads us sometimes to strange and hard places like Baal Zephon. A place that we don't want to be. A place that tries us. A place that exercises us. And it's hard. And you know, once they arrived... There was no hint of how they were going to get across. God didn't reveal that to them. You can almost imagine them, can't you? There they are. They gather at the Red Sea. There's the sea directly in front of them. There's mountains on this side, mountains on that side. They just come from the West. And you can almost hear them going, well, what are we doing here? What's happening? Why has God led us here? We've suddenly come to an impasse. This is always God's way. He tests our faith. He challenges our resources. Sometimes he brings us to an end of ourselves. And you know, friends, he does not necessarily reveal everything in one go. That's not how life works, is it? He leads us step by step. Day by day, he restricts his light to one step at a time. Why? So that we might be kept in continual dependence upon him. He would have your faith. He would have your worship. He wants you to lean everything upon him. And so he restricts that light to one day, one step at a time. You know, friends, if ever you're unsure of what to do or what decision to make, and you find yourself at an impasse, 
simply commit your future to the Lord and live by faith in the here and now. Leave the future to God. Think only of your obedience. Think only of your duty to God. And he will lead the way. Perhaps that's you this evening. Perhaps you are in Baal Zephon tonight. You're hemmed in by circumstance. You're hemmed in by providence. And you're wondering perhaps which way to turn. Well, perhaps there's no easy answer to you tonight. But all I can counsel you is this. Just think only of your Christian duty. Think only of your obedience. Do what you can and leave God to do what you cannot do. The road that God told them to take was not altogether an erratic one, but it was a strange one. And the experience of the Lord's people is such that they can point to perhaps events in their lives when they, they see God leading them into a difficult situation. Sometimes that happens. So we have a mysterious providence. Secondly, we have a clear plan. A clear plan. The Lord was not leading them blindly. If we can say tonight by grace that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I tell you this, he is ever going before you. He is ever breaking up your way. He's already been there before you will be there. He knows the terrain. He will go before you in a, in a wonderful way. And he had purpose we must remember from all eternity to lead those two million people to that very spot between Migdol and the Red Sea over against Baal Zephon. Why did he do it? Why did he lead them there? I think it was to accomplish three things. And it reminds us, friends, that God is able to use a single event to accomplish multiple objectives. You think about this pandemic that's come upon us. I believe on the one hand, it is a judgment upon our nation. I believe firmly that it is a chastisement upon the Lord's people. But it's not all doom and gloom. You think about these broadcasts that various congregations have been able to make. How the word of God has reached people across the other side of the world. You think about what God can do in the midst of confusion and chaos and turmoil. We only ever see part of it. He sees the whole picture. And I believe that the Lord has done wonderful things. It's not all been doom and gloom. He's able to use a single event to accomplish lots. And that's exactly what he does here. He does three things. First of all, he brings them to this spot to bait Pharaoh. To bait Pharaoh. Pharaoh's heart was still very hard. You know, friends, he'd seen so much. He'd seen these wonderful miracles. He'd seen things today that you and I would love to see, but he had seen all these things and it had made him harder and harder. This goes to show that miracles do not save a person. People say, oh, if I show you a miracle, I believe. That's absolute rubbish. Pharaoh saw the greatest wonders and his heart was hardened. And he was still torn over his decision to let the people of Israel go. You know, friends, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man is also dangerous. And that's what Pharaoh was. He was a dangerous, double-minded man. In his haste, he makes up his mind to pursue after the Israelites. We read that in verses 5 to 7 of chapter 14. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled and the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And what does he do? He doesn't consult more. He simply makes ready his chariot and he takes his people with him. And he took 600, 600 of the finest Egyptian chariots 
with him. God arranged circumstances in such a way that it appeared that they had gotten lost. Behind it all was the sovereign hand of God. Behind it all was the Lord to lure Pharaoh and to force him out into the open. Read of that in verse 8. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. God was not merely going to destroy Pharaoh. He was going to wipe out their entire army. Think of what he'd done. He had brought Egypt to its, <coughs> its knees. He had stripped them of their economy. He had completely torn the country apart with his plagues. And now he was going to strip them of their army. He was going to leave them defenseless. He was going to leave them vulnerable to neighboring attacks. And in those days, that's the last thing you wanted. So he strips the nation of everything. He punishes Egypt for persecuting his people. And God was going to be glorified. He was going to be glorified in the destruction of the wicked. You know, friends, it's very solemn. On that last and terrible day, the Lord will bring his people to himself and they will praise him and they will worship the lamb and they will worship Christ and his name will be glorified. But let me tell you this, my friends, even in the destruction of the wicked in hell, his name will be glorified. He says in scripture that he will get honor upon Pharaoh. He will have it one way or another. If Pharaoh did not honor him in his life, he will now get honor upon Pharaoh. Psalm 76, verse 10, surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. What a solemn truth that is. The Egyptians pursue. And you know how the story goes. They are drowned and sink to the bottom as a stone. You turn into the next chapter, Exodus 15, and we read in verse 1, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord. And in verse 6 they sing, Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed, the pieces in hath dashed in pieces the enemy. And in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee, which sent us forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright as an heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. And you read the words of verse 10, it's wonderful, isn't it? Thou didst blow with thy wind, the sea covered them. How proud and arrogant the Egyptians were. Pharaoh thought he could take on God. What a foolish man. And so he baits Pharaoh. The second objective that he accomplished was to teach Israel. God would have his people know that for him nothing is impossible. Moses encourages them not to be afraid. He tells them to stand still and to see the salvation of the Lord. God had revealed something of his plan to Moses, not everything, but he knew that, but Moses knew enough to be able to encourage the children of Israel. He knew that God was in control in all the midst of this chaos and turmoil and confusion. He sat on the throne. Well, the stage is set. The pieces are moving. Imagine it. Just imagine it in your mind. The Egyptians are closing in on them. Their chariots have advanced. Pharaoh's at the front. 
He sees the children of Israel. He can smell fear. He can discern panic. And he says, charge. And they begin to march upon them. There's panic. There's chaos. There's confusion. They complain to Moses. And Moses tells them to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And then God tells Israel to do something very strange. Go forward. Go forward. What? Into the sea? Into death itself? Go forward. And I will be with you. I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Go forward. You know, friends, all God wants us to do sometimes is to wait, not move. Watch, not fight. Well, the angel of the Lord now comes into the scene. The angel of the Lord has already gone before the children of Israel in verses 1 to 18. And now he comes in between the two, shielding the Israelites from the Egyptians. And he fights. He fights for them. God now goes ahead and he does the impossible. Moses takes up his staff, the same staff that he had used to usher in these plagues. He takes up that staff in his hand, raises it in faith, and at once a strong east wind appears out of nowhere and blows upon the sea. And that great sea, that red sea, that mighty impassable impossible sea at once splits open with a tremendous roar creating a pathway through the waters straight to the other side can you imagine that can you imagine the scene can you imagine the drama can you imagine the sound of it all what would you do if you were there you just go wow You'd be left speechless. This is the way. Walk ye in it. Walk ye in it. Now the angel comes behind them. Just as God said he would. Isaiah chapter 52 verse 12. For the Lord will go before you and the God of Israel will be your rear word. Literally your rear God. He comes behind them, he gathers them, and he goes forward with them. Darkness to the children, to, to, the, to the Egyptians and to the, his own children, he is a light to them in the night. This is the way walk ye in it. I'm reminded again of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 29. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians are saying to do, were drowned. Now, I do not believe that the faith referred to there was the faith of the nation, because the nation did not believe in the Lord. They saw his wonders, but they did not believe as they should. I believe that the faith that is being referred to here is the faith of the faithful few, the likes of Moses, Aaron, Caleb, Miriam. The, Is the Israelites as a nation were hardened in unbelief themselves, that we, we know of that as we go on. The church was only ever among the nation. And for the sake of the remnant, the nation was saved. Well, what's the lesson? Well, it's this, with God, nothing is impossible. And that is a lesson, friends, that we have to learn and relearn and relearn again. We have to learn it as individuals. We have to learn it as a denomination. 
As a denomination, we face many difficulties, as become evident this week in General Assembly, and we might find ourselves in Baal Zephon, and we don't know where to turn. The pressures are mounting, the congregations are dwindling, and we wonder what is going to happen to us. We have to remember that the Lord is still on the throne. He still lives. He hasn't changed. With God, nothing is impossible. He can create a way through the waters. And does he not do that in your own personal experience? How many times has he created a path through the waters? And what he will do at death, make a path through the waters, straight to the other side. With God, nothing is impossible. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Why not? Because we know the God who specializes in the impossible. A.W. Pink on his commentary of this chapter, argues that the waters did not divide until the Israelites came to the brink of the shore. And that the sea did not divide at once, but gradually as they went forward. Another has put it like this. It does not require faith to begin a journey when I can see all the way through. But to begin when I see merely the first step, that is faith. The sea opened as Israel moved forward so that every fresh step was cast upon God. Such was the path along which the redeemed of the Lord moved under his own directing hand. That's an interesting alternative by Mr. Pink. I don't agree with him, but that point about faith being a journey, I readily accept and welcome. So he brings them to the spot to bait Pharaoh, to teach Israel, and thirdly and very briefly, to magnify Moses. God had already exalted Moses in the eyes of the nation, but when he worked through Moses at the Red Sea, he exalted him even further. And he bestowed upon Moses authority, an authority that he would have to exercise in the coming challenging days that still lay ahead. Friends, let us never forget that we only ever see part of the picture. As we sang his ways in the sea, his footsteps at times are not known. So let us trust him when we cannot necessarily trace him in providence. And let us learn to recall God's past help to encourage us when we face future challenges. That's the secret to living the Christian life recalling past mercies. They become fuel in the present to face the future challenges. Lastly, and more briefly now, a separated people. Thirdly and finally, a separated people. The apostle Paul refers to this wonderful event in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Moreover, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, how that all your fathers were under the sea and all passed through the sea and were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. What is he doing here? Well, he connects Israel's deliverance to the sacrament of baptism. The apostle is saying that Israel's baptism into the sea was a kind of outward and visible sign that they had been severed at last from Egypt, never to return again. 
just as the Israelites passed through the Red Sea and were cut off once and for all from the tyranny of Pharaoh, from the mastery of the Egyptians, and were separated unto God as a consecrated people devoted to his fear and his worship. So believers in the New Testament in baptism are cut off, as it were, from the mastery of sin and the tyranny of Satan and separated unto God as a consecrated people devoted to his worship. All of which this was a picture. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting for a moment that when that once a person is baptized, he is regenerated. It's heresy. I'm simply saying that when an adult is saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus, he must be baptized. For the outward cleansing symbolizes what has taken place within. That he is severed from the mastery and tyranny of sin. Ah, the, corrupt, the, the remnants of corruption are still very strong. But the dominion of sin has been broken in his life. And so as we close, let us leave this passage utterly convinced of the almighty power and glory of God the wisdom of providence, the wonder of redemption, and the necessity of faith. Let us go forward in all the ups and downs of life, trusting that the path will be made open to us. Let us leave our future to our God. Let us realize that sometimes it is better to be still and know that he is God than to go running in our own steam and in our own strength. Sometimes it is better to wait and watch the Lord stretch out his hand to perform his wonders. And let us never forget, let us never forget that were it not for the Lord Jesus Christ, who waded, as it were, through a red sea, a red sea of death, and abandonment and blood, we would never be separated from Pharaoh, from Satan, and consecrated to God. Friends, are we a separated people tonight? Are we living epistles known and read of all men? Have we been delivered from Pharaoh through this great and wonderful redemption at the cross? Have we experienced this baptism into Christ? Have we been delivered from Egypt tonight? May the Lord bless this portion. Amen. Let us pray. We bless thee, O Lord, that thy way is in the sea, and thy footsteps are not known, and that thy way is higher than our ways, and thy thoughts than ours. And we thank thee that this is so, because then thou wouldst not be God. Help us, O oh Lord, to trust thee. Help us, O oh Lord, to learn from this wonderful passage. Give us, O oh Lord, to realize that thou art our shepherd, and thou wilt never lead us blindly anywhere. And all oh, may we trust thee when we cannot trace thee in providence. O oh Lord, be the breaker up of our way. Bless thy dear people here. Go before them even this week in all the ups and downs of life. And if they find themselves hemmed in, as it were, in Baal Zephon, oh, may they cry out unto thee and grant them deliverance. O oh, Lord, be our God this week, as we will be thy people. Bless us and pardon all sin. For Jesus' sake, amen. <clears throat> our closing item of praise shall be Psalm 124. Psalm 124, the first version. Had not the Lord been on our side, may Israel now say, had not the Lord been on our side when men rose us to slay, they had us swallowed quick when as their wrath against us did flame, waters had covered us, our soul had sunk beneath the stream. 
Then had the water swelling high over our soul made way. Blessed be the Lord who to their teeth us gave not for a prey. Our souls escaped as a bird out of the foulest snare. The snare asunder broken is and we escape it are. And how wonderful these words are. Verse 8, our sure and all-sufficient help is in Jehovah's name. His name who did the heaven create and who the earth did frame. Psalm 124, the first version to God's praise. At night the Lord be on our side.